Hello and welcome to another uh, of our little COVID lecture videos. Um, this is following on from the um, British Army publication I pushed out in the week on leading through a crisis, um, which at the moment is a very pertinent topic of uh, discussion. Um, in it, it mentions Mission Command. Um, so I just wanted to give my thoughts on, uh, on Mission Command. And because I think this is such a serious topic, I even uh, dusted off my uniform, uh, even though working from home, uh, to give you this video today. And I also spent a considerable amount of time preparing a very elaborate um, Prezi presentation, which had fantastic uh, pictures, cat pictures, it had CrossFit pictures, it had all sorts of stuff in it. Um, but Prezi let me down. Uh, Prezi didn't work today. So we're going to try something else. So bear with me. Um, this is inspired by the RS Animate series, uh, Sir Ken Robinson's uh, famous video on education. So we're going to see if I can do something similar. Bear with me two seconds. Okay, there we go. So for those who have a more visual learning, uh, this is me, uh, Flock Tent Side Bows, as I'm obviously indicating there. Um, this is the first time I've ever tried anything like this, so please bear with me. I am just telling you that Prezi did not work. Um, my thumb was, thumbs down was too big for the camera, unfortunately. Um, but let's talk through some of the topics that I would have discussed. So we're going to start off with talking about the why we're discussing it. I've talked about Leading Through Crisis, a very good publication and a very timely publication as well that British Army pushed out. Um, so that is very good. Um, leading on from that, this is a crisis with COVID-19. There's no two ways about it. So Mission Command is a very important subject to understand. It's a very important leadership philosophy to get your head around because it will help you in times of crisis, which we are undoubtedly in. Project Phoenix is going to launch at the end of the week, uh, as I'm obviously drawing there. Uh, that is going to be the planning phase for the Oxford University Air Squadron return to training with all the restrictions that we've got. Now, Mission Command, I believe, is going to help us through this. So that's why I want you to understand some of the central tenets of Mission Command to help us through planning how we're going to train with COVID-19. Um, I'm drawing a crown there because it's the coronavirus, but that's slightly out of, video, uh, out of shot. Like I said, this is the first time I've done this. Let's start with looking at the why of Mission Command. First and foremost, Mission Command is not a silver bullet. It is not categorically the way that we should lead. It's not the leadership philosophy. It is a leadership philosophy that has many, many uh, benefits to it but it is only a form of leadership philosophy. So what I've drawn there is a, um, a spectrum of command and control. So on that spectrum, at one end you have mission command, which is more decentralized, um, and then you also have centralized command and control. So what I'm drawing there uh, is the seven Ps. Prior preparation and planning prevents piss poor performance. In the military, we like lots of planning, lots of training, and we have a well-disciplined hierarchy. So in certain situations, it is best for one person to have control and tell you all how it's going to be based on an established plan that is written and laid down. And that works really well. Uh, for example, if you're down the range on the 25 meter range, you don't want decentralized command. The sergeant who has the range is in command. If he tells you to stop, you stop. Uh, that sort of tight, rigid, hierarchical, disciplined control, command and control is entirely appropriate in many situations. Um, there's also, uh, I've, yes, I put flat in Dior there because uh, obviously doing your strikes on the range with him. There are other situations where you might want this level of tight control. Uh, context will tell you a lot about the leadership philosophy you want. In the context of the Cuban Missile Crisis, I'm sorry, I'm not very good at drawing boats. Um, but in the context of the Cuban Missile Crisis, with such a serious end result if it went wrong, like nuclear holocaust, do you really want to decentralise command and control away from you? JFK didn't, Khrushchev didn't. They wanted to keep it nice and tight to make sure no one makes a single false move that ends up in nuclear Armageddon. Um, not sure why nuclear Armageddon is pink. Um, so in certain situations, if the context dictates it, command and control nice and tight is good. However, um, 
Von Malk the Elder, who we'll talk about later, he used to say that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Um, I actually prefer Mike Tyson's parody of that, where it says everyone's got a plan until they're punched in the mouth. It doesn't matter how much prior planning and preparation you've done, how good your hierarchy is, how good your discipline is, uh, there are many historical examples, the situation can become so dynamic, so fast changing and fast paced, you cannot keep pace with it. Um, and that tight command and control isn't going to work for you. In those situations, mission command really comes into its own and that's why it's important to have an understanding. Crisis situations are that situation. Um, sorry, it took me a while to draw Mike Tyson with his uh, tattoo on his face. But the point is, mission command is not the only way to lead in the British forces. Sometimes, especially air power, with the technology we have, can be controlled from a central point to achieve its aims. Sorry, Maggie's come to say hello as well. Oh, um, also, there are other situations, I'm drawing a little Napoleon there, um, where technology, I've said that the Air Force technology allows at the moment for centralised command and control, which it does, the technology we have in our aircraft. Also, though, when technology was poorer, so when you were dealing with muskets, flags and shouting to each other, actually decentralised control works really well for you because the commander, miles back from the front, doesn't have much essay of what's going on. So you want to devolve that down to your marshals and your captains like Napoleon did so well. Um, and I've seen it in my career. Uh, my CV is Telic and Herrick for the most part. And in complex counterinsurgencies like that, um, tight control from a centralised point wasn't always the best way forward. Often the best way was to decentralise, use mission command and let the guys on the ground with the best understanding of the situation have the lead. Decentralised execution was often the best way forward. Um, and COVID-19 is another situation where if you try and keep that centralised command, no matter how talented you are, uh, no matter how big your brain is, eventually you'll drive yourself around the bend. Um, you cannot keep control of a fast paced and complex situation no matter how hard you try and trying will make matters worse as public health England found at the start of the COVID-19 outbreak. So we've had a look at the why of Mission Command and why Mission Command can be useful to us and I think could be useful to you for Project Phoenix. What is Mission Command? Um, it's the what, so when you've given someone a problem you tell them what the problem is. You also tell them why you're doing it. What you don't do is you don't tell them how. You've got to devolve that responsibility, like General Patton used to say, let people surprise and impress you, devolve it down, tell them what you want, why you want it, but let them figure out the how. The advantage of doing this, as my great little drawing shows, it's dynamic, it's quick, okay? You can't always be there in the right place at the right time to tell people what you want. So delegate that authority down and let the people who can respond the quickest come up with the solutions. Do not tell them how, let them figure it out. And as Colonel John Boyd, one of my favourite airmen, um, said, it's all about the OODA, OODA loop. Observe, orientate, decide and act. And the smaller that loop is, and if you can get inside your enemy's loop, your decision loop, you can operate faster than they can and potentially outthink them. That's why in counterinsurgency, Mission Command is such a useful tool. Okay, it's dynamic, it's fast. Um, as I'm drawing there, little minor, um, people in command positions may not have the best understanding of the context of the situation. In the Cold War, I have no doubt that the generals in the bunkers had the best understanding of what was going on. They had all of the bright red phones, JFK, Khrushchev, they knew what was going on better than anyone else. However, in complex situations like counterinsurgencies, on the ground, uh, downtown Kandahar, um, you may not know what is going on best in the ops room. It may be your captain and your major on the ground. So it's best to devolve down to those people at the coalface with the best situational awareness and understanding. So where does mission command come from? Uh, we looked at broadly what it is, but where does it come from? So the Navy would be pleased to hear um, that Different readings in history. In my opinion, um, I think Nelson was one of the first people, uh, there are examples in ancient history, but Nelson was one of the first people to really embrace it um, in places like Trafalgar 
um, with his aphorism that uh, no captain can do far wrong if he pulls alongside the enemy um, and gets nice and stuck in. He was communicating with his generals with visual signals, semaphore, things like this. Uh, and in the fog of uh, war, that friction, the noise, uh, everything that's going on in battle, it's easy to lose that uh, communication um, with your captains, um, his uh, band of brothers. So he trusted them that they would get stuck in and pull alongside the French and get uh, a broadside ripped into them. So that was around 1805, something like that, Trafalgar. Uh, more commonly, um, this is accredited to Napoleon once again, the little Frenchman over the other side. Uh, his double victory at Jena and Auderstadt, um, I'm not sure how that's spelt or said, Auderstadt I think. His double victory there over the Prussians, who were a small professional army, commonly regarded as the premier army in Europe. They were defeated by uh, a free army of Frenchmen that many regarded as a ragtag force that were ill-disciplined and ill-trained, and they absolutely walloped them. So after the disaster of the, the Prussians facing General Nardestat, uh, General Scharnhorst, not the battleship Scharnhorst, the general, uh, he studied the battle and decided that the Prussians didn't think cleverly enough, no matter how brave they fought. So he brought in a series of reforms that um, von Molk the Elder, um, I didn't know how to show his old, so I drew him in a wheelchair, um, aged. So von Molk the Elder, just a name, he wasn't that old, he took these reforms on and won a great victory over the French in 1870 during the Franco-Prussian War. The techniques that he used uh, for this and the system of command that they felt was more responsive, the lessons they learned from Napoleon, was called Ausfrag Taktik. Uh, this was the start of mission command. Um, from this point um, in the 1870s, the Germans developed this leadership style and we get the great generals of World War II. You get Rommel, Guderian, Manstein, who engineered the fall of France with uh, their plan yellow uh, in a matter of weeks. Any of you who've been on staff rides will know that we constantly talk about the Germans, how amazing they were. And at the tactical and operational level, they really, really were. Mission Command was a great success during World War II until Hitler started to take a lot of centralised control. Uh, and then things started to fall apart as the Wehrmacht were not allowed to establish these taught Prussian leadership techniques that they'd always used. Um, snowman, yes, okay, I'm drawing a snowman because of the Cold War. So things moved on in the Cold War. As I've already said, the Cuban Missile Crisis, we have a situation of impending thermonuclear war. Um, everyone knows their targets. Up at Kinloss, everyone knew where they were heading with their buckets of sunshine in the Nimrod. Um, so everyone had their targets allocated by huge static armies. Everyone knew who was going to attack what. So this was not a situation that Mission Command was useful, frankly. Um, we wanted close command and control held in the centre. However, Field Marshal Bagnall, um, in his reforms, he was one of these guys, he'd grown up fighting in the Malaya emergency, and he saw the merit in a leadership style based on the Auschwitz technique that became Mission Command. Okay, Field Marshal Bagnall, very, very smart man, and he had to fight for us to get this Mission Command um, brought in and then NATO adopted it and ever since sort of the mid 2000s it's uh, been widely taught within NATO. Um, it's made up of various parts. One of the major parts of mission command is the commander's intent. You should know what your boss two levels up, so for you, OCO you ask, you should know what his intent is. He should make that intent clear to you. Now, not everyone is Martin Luther King. Not everyone has a beautiful dream and a beautiful vision. But you, as a boss, should be able to give at least a mission to your subordinates so they know your direction of travel, where you want them to go. If you do not give them your commander's intent and it's clear and they understand it, you should not delegate authority because they don't understand what you want of them. Commander's intent is one of the key principles to mission command. Um, in our leadership video previously, we've talked about Brené Baum and her book, Dare, uh, Dare to Lead. In it, she talks about how leadership for her is essentially values based. You have to be authentic and you have to make yourself vulnerable and be willing to fail. All of these things are true of mission command. So as a commander with your intent, you also have to promote your values. So for us, that's rise. We must stick to our values and be authentic or the commander's intent won't hold especially in stressful crisis situations, 
your values become even more important. You must hold to them. Second key thing for me is responsibilities. Everyone must understand their own responsibilities in making Mission Commander success. The commander, he has a responsibility to pass his intent down and make sure everyone understands it. But the subordinates have an understanding also, sorry, have a responsibility also. Just like I was taught in rugby. You can either decide to go through the man, around the tackler, or even chip over him. The only thing you can do wrong is make no decision. You have a responsibility when you have a ball have the ball to make a decision. And I think rugby teaches us a lot about life. I would say that as a rugby player. Um, but the same is true in mission command. Subordinates, the followers, the squadron, your commander has given you his intent. You have a responsibility to follow through and act on that intent. There is no excuse for sitting around twiddling your thumbs and not taking action. You must act. You have a responsibility to act. So as I said, when you have the ball, just like being a follower mission command, you have a responsibility to act. If you don't act and you're indecisive, you might lose the ball, you might lose the initiative. Mission command requires the followers to take responsibility and act. However, the commander also has another responsibility, not just to clearly pass you his intent and make sure that you understand it, just like in CrossFit, People hurt themselves if they're not trained properly and they don't know how to lift. You must be trained properly and that is the commander's responsibility. If you do not feel that you have been trained adequately, you must tell the commander. That is your responsibility. If you, you cannot be empowered if you are not trained and able to carry out the intent that the commander has given you. Um, another responsibility that the commander has is to give you your left and right of arc. Uh, you'll learn about this in Fieldcraft, you may have learned about it on strikes already, but when you're down the range, you have a left and right of arc. The limitations, the rules, and there will be rules for things like Project Phoenix, uh, reference COVID-19, there are rules that dictate your freedom of action, your left and right of arc. You must understand those, and if you do not, it's your responsibility to put your hand up and say that you don't, and it's your commander's responsibility to make sure that the left and right of arc are very clear. That's an essential responsibility. I've already mentioned the word empowerment. Empowerment is key to mission command. If good empowerment does not take place, mission command simply fails. Um, that's Braveheart with his big sword. Um, oh, and his blue face as well. Freedom, freedom of action. That is key to mission command. You must have the freedom to act swiftly, to get inside the decision cycle of your enemy. Dynamically, creatively, use your initiative. Um, I think the Americans call Mission Command Disciplined Initiative. Uh, you have rules, a left and right of arc, but they want you to innovate. They want you to show initiative. Um, but it is about trust. You can't be empowered if your commander trusts, or you both, it's mutual trust. You trust that you've been trained and you understand, and you trust that the commander's got your back if things go wrong and you fail, which is, you know integral to mission command as well. He must have your back if you're acting with good intentions. Um, another crown there. So there's a difference between abdication and delegation. Abdication, uh, which our queen understands fully, um, abdication must never take place. You must never give away your authority, responsibility and accountability as the leader. You can delegate it though, but you can only delegate it if they feel they have been trained and empowered correctly. Otherwise it becomes abdication. You're just giving away that responsibility and accountability. And that's where danger lurks. If your people are empowered correctly, trained with mutual understanding and mutual trust. Building your team is vital in mission command. Um, and I think my last point there was that you delegate until you feel uncomfortable, which is why I draw the tight underpants, small underpants. Delegate as a commander until it feels really uncomfortable. You're probably in the right place then, and mission command is probably happening. How then? So how are we going to make mission command our command philosophy? I know you asked to bring about Project Phoenix. Um, Clifford Gertz, a famous sociologist, used to talk about um, man spins his own webs of significance. Um, that's what culture is. Um, it's stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. Culture, it's a very, very difficult thing to describe. Um, it's like being in love, you know, you know it, you know it when you're in it, but it's difficult to describe. 
Culture is the same, but Mission Command requires a culture change, which is really hard to do. Any of you who've read or studied the All Blacks, part of the reason they were so successful was they had that um, no dickheads culture. Um, even Richie McCaw was sweeping out the changing room. They had a uh, no question, um, they would accept no nothing but perfection, um, but they were all in it together and they had a very successful culture. Legacy is a very good book on the All Blacks culture. Um, but we are going to have to get a culture to administer mission command as our philosophy that is happy to take risks, that isn't risk averse. We just manage risk and deal with it. We're nice and calm. Even in a crisis situation like we're in, we always have that ability to take a breath before we decide and then act. We have to accept that in a dynamic and fluid situation, sometimes the 80% solution is your gold standard. You haven't got time to come up with a perfect admin order and 100% solution. Rules will change. Limitations, your left and right of arc, will shift rapidly. You must move with it. An 80% solution is often, often what you need. Be willing to lead. Be willing to take the front step. Be willing to follow. Be a good follower as well. Be an effective follower. Uh, don't be a passenger. Um, don't be a hostage taker. Be a good, effective follower. And if you're not going to follow and you're not going to lead, just get out of the way. Um, th these things move too fast. <laughs> um, and as Rocky would say, if you fall down, get back up again. Um, it's not about the hits you can give. It's about how many hits you can take. Um, that's life. Um, so mission command is the same. You are going to fail. Okay, it's a dynamic crisis situation. Project Phoenix is going to have failures. It's going to have successes as well, though. Enjoy your successes as a team. It's not the commander who owns them, it's the team. Um, but also accept that you're going to fail and take the failure and move on. Um, I did forget one little thing on my drawing, so I'm just going to skip through to the next video. So I've referenced Project Phoenix a few times, and there will be more details coming out on Friday, the, the 31st of July for you all. Um, there we go. But when is Project Phoenix happening? When do we need this culture of mission command? Right now. We need it right now um, because, as is clearly evident to you guys, COVID-19 is a crisis. We are in a situation of crisis that requires dynamic leadership. I put it to you that the command philosophy of mission command has got to a lot to offer uh, the new senior leadership team, uh, Tabby and her team. So. Be a follower that can be empowered. Tabby and her team will give you everything they can. The staff will help you with training, with that empowerment. But Project Phoenix, for it to be a success, has to come from you. Okay, We need to build this from the ground up. It's the only way we're going to cope with this situation is be dynamic and responsive. It's going to take dealing with the crisis, which COVID-19 is. Um, more details to come.